Hi everybody, Perry Wilson here. I have seen so many studies coming out recently um, employing generative AI like ChatGPT and trying to tangle with the question of how that's gonna change healthcare, how, how we integrate this new tool into our practice. And I'm gonna talk about one of those studies this week, but I, I thought it'd be a good opportunity to kind of think of like the bigger picture of how generative AIs like this change medicine. Um, but let's talk about what we mean when we say generative AI, as opposed to whatever the alternative is. I'm calling it non-generative AI, or maybe you might call it typical AI. So the, the way we've used machine learning and artificial intelligence in medicine is, um, is really taking a lot of data and compressing it down into a single output, right? So you take a bunch of data from the electronic health record or from genomic data or wherever your data source is, but a bunch of inputs and you make like a prediction at the end, right? A single number that says, you know, what is the chance that this patient is gonna die in the next year or will develop diabetes in the next six months, right? It, it, it's taking a bunch of stuff and compressing it. It is fundamentally reductionist. And, and that's really where AI and medicine has been for a long time, right? You take an X-ray, which is a ton of data, and you compress it into, you know, yes, no pneumonia, right? A binary type of assessment. Generative AI is fundamentally different Although the architecture is somewhat the same, you're taking inputs and the inputs can be multiple, although in general, they're just kind of text-based prompts. Um, but instead of compressing those inputs down to a single output, you know, yes, no diabetes, you are, you're, you're creating uh, multiple outputs. You're actually creating more as an output than is put in to begin with, which is how you can take a prompt, um, like I, I put in a prompt to a generative AI uh, that said, you know, serious doctor discussing artificial intelligence, right? And I got this, um, which is which is which is not bad. He looks um, he looks somewhat concerned. Okay, so how do we use generative AI? Something that fundamentally expands on the data we have available, as opposed to reducing the data we have available. Well. Let's start talking about ChatGPT, the most famous generative AI. Those of you who haven't played with it, it's fun to play with. And it is a pretty decent test taker. So some of the studies that are out there have shown that if you just feed questions from, for example, a college level microbiology exam um, and let ChatGPT pick the answer, you're gonna score about a 95%, which is obviously pretty good. Um, and, and multiple studies have actually shown that ChatGPT can pass the United States Medical Licensing Exam, step one, um, you know, something many uh, doctors have, have taken and suffered through. Um, and so highly impressive, but I, I should point out that it, some studies have shown that it did not pass certain exams, the gastroenterology self-assessment uh, test, for example, and only got a 64% passing on that test is a 70%. The ophthalmology practice test was 50%. This is transient. I, I have no doubt that as more data is fed in and as um, these devices are optimized to take tests, remember they weren't built to take tests at all, um, you'll get much, much higher scores. So we cannot rest on, we can't say like, oh no, we're still better test takers. That is, we're at a very brief moment in time when that is gonna be true. So it's important to remember that the practice of medicine is not a multiple choice test, right? You, you, you take tests like that, but when you see a patient in front of you, they don't give you five options of what the diagnosis might be or what the next appropriate test is. And they also present you with a lot of information that is not relevant, um, that is perhaps incorrect, right? A patient may tell you something that, um, that, that they're mistaken about, might lead you down the wrong path. It's much more complicated than a standardized test. So m my question is, okay, so how do we use this tool to actually make our lives easier? And there was a paper that came out this week in JAM Internal Medicine that sort of prompted me to put this little talk together because it is one way that I think that we can make friends with the robots. Um, but to do that, we need to talk about medical notes. So documentation of what we do when we see patients is obviously very important. And there are many purposes to medical notes, right? It serves as uh, a reminder to the provider themselves. What have we discussed with the patient? What do we think is going on? You know, we're seeing hundreds of patients. It's nice to look back at your notes and see what the thought process was and to move the case forward. Obviously, the notes are important for communication to other providers. You know, what, what do I think is going on? What's our plan? What's moving forward? Um, 
notes are uh, incredibly important for medical billing, right? The, the, the level at which you can bill a visit depends critically on the elements in the note. And I think, unfortunately, that has corrupted our notes to some extent. They are, they are chock full nowadays of stuff that is really extraneous to direct care of the patient just to sort of justify that we thought hard enough and we spent enough time with the patient to justify a certain billing classification when the salient, the meat of the note could be, is, is, is much less. And I think that's a real problem. And in fact, there's really good data to show that notes have a lot of problems. One of the one of the the, the most important ones is 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 copy and pasting. Um, so this is a study that came out in 2022 that looked at you know thousands and thousands of medical record notes and just went to look at how much of that note was copied and pasted from a prior note. And as you can see here, you know, in terms of progress notes, particularly inpatient progress notes, you've got you know two thirds of the content of the entire note is a copy and paste from the other notes. And on the right-hand side, you can see that the longer the medical record is, the more of any given note is copied and pasted. And I have seen this, you know, as, as an attending here at um, Yale New Haven Hospital. Um, we have amazing medical students and residents. Nevertheless, they're very busy. The temptation of copy and paste is there. And I see things in the medical record that are no longer true, you know, that were once true. We're treating the patient for C. diff or something when we are no longer treating them for C. diff. That is a direct result of copy and paste. So medical notes are a mess. And I think in part, it's because we're forced to put so much in there that doesn't actually um, communicate our plan to other providers or ourselves, right? It's there for, for medical legal reasons. It's there for billing reasons. So can chat GPT write your history of present illness? This is the study that came out in JAM Internal Medicine, comparison of history of pre present illness summaries generated by a chatbot and senior internal medicine residents. So the question is, you know, that whole, that whole HPI, can we have the computer do that instead of us, you know, maybe saving us time, um, uh, and, uh, and frustration at constantly being inside the electronic health record. Um, so here's how the study worked. So first of all, um, the, the team had a number of scripts that were, you know, uh, theoretically a discussion that a doctor might have with a patient, you know, that, that in-person discussion, that thing that AIs cannot do because they're not yet physically embodied, but we are. Um, and you can see a sample of a script here. This is, you know, the doctor says, what brings you here? The patient says, I'm having some discomfort in my chest and I'm worried about it. I thought I'd better see a doctor. So here I am, right? We've all been there. Um, and it goes on to talk about how severe it is and is it a pressure or a tightness and does it radiate and all the sort of classic chest pain questions you would ask if you saw, if you saw a patient. Um, these scripts were then given to uh, medical residents, senior medical residents who had to write an HPI, right? You know, so the patient presents with a chief complaint of chest pain and so on and so forth. But the script was also given to ChatGPT. And the, 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 the authors had to work a bit to get a good HPI out of ChatGPT. So remember, you have to give, this is, ChatGPT is very general. It's not designed to write HPIs. Um, you have to give it a prompt. And so you can see the first prompt, the basic prompt they said was read the following patient interview and write an HPI, do not use abbreviations or acronyms. And um, they, they had the chatbot generate, you know, from any given script, multiple HPIs. Remember, there's an element of randomness in these generative AIs. Um, so, so every time you do it, even on the same script, you're gonna get a different, a slightly different output. And what they found, what you see here, this two number is the, the, the mean number of errors per HPI. And I'll show you an example of an error in a minute. And so they had to refine the prompt a little bit. Um, so reminding the GPT to use standard medical terminology and language that is typically found in medical notes. Okay, still a fair number of errors until they said only include information that is explicitly stated by the patient. Do not include information about age or gender unless explicitly stated. Why did they have to say that? Do not use abbreviations or acronyms. So this very, now we're getting to a very specific prompt to try to get it to output something that we like. And what they did is they had it using that prompt generate about 10, 10 HPIs. And then they picked one that was sort of 
particularly good. Okay, so this is highly selected. This isn't throw stuff into the, 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 the chat box, the chat bot, and get an HPI out. Highly selected stuff here. Um, and then they mixed the AI one in with a bunch of resident ones, and they asked, um, you know, senior attendings, can you, can you tell the difference? Um, so here's an example of an AI written history of present illness from that chest pain patient. The patient presents with a complaint of discomfort in the chest that has been ongoing for the past three weeks. The discomfort is described as a seven out of 10 in severity, usually starting in the middle of the chest, sometimes radiating to the left arm. The discomfort can come on any time, is not related to exertion or eating, and may be worse with stress. The patient does not experience sharp pain, nausea, or vomiting. The discomfort lasts for a few minutes and is accompanied by shortness of breath. The patient reports no history of similar symptoms in the past. Fine, right? I mean, if you saw this in a medical record, I don't know, I probably wouldn't immediately think that an AI wrote it. Seems perfectly reasonable to me. Um, now there were inaccuracies that they that they um, they pulled out. So so for instance, Chat GPT, remember, the way it's working is it's it's predicting the next word based on essentially the prior words uh, that it has seen, right? Just based on just based on likelihood, based on the the tremendous amount of data it has seen in the past. And so uh, apparently a lot of uh, what it generated started the HPI saying the patient is a, for example, 59-year-old male. When age and gender are not provided in the transcript, this is such a critical insight, right? Why does it put age and gender there? Well, because it's read a lot of HPIs, right? That's part of its data corpus. And in most of those, if not all of those HPIs, like most HPIs open with, you know, the patient is a 73-year-old female, the patient is a 22-year-old male, the patient is, right, age and gender almost always there. So it knows it's supposed to put that there. And ChatGPT is not designed to ensure its own accuracy. It's designed to create something that seems human. It seems like a human wrote it. And it knows that HPIs are supposed to start with an age and gender. So it throws in an age and gender, even though that information is incorrect, which is why they had to update the prompt to say, like, please don't write anything about age and gender unless it is specifically mentioned. That's called hallucination, and it is doing it to make its output seem more intelligible to a human, seem more human. But it's it's lying, essentially. Um, and you can see another example here. ChatGPT wrote that it has not been relieved by antacids, but in the patient script, uh, the, the, the patient says, um, uh, that antacids hadn't been tried. So, so again, you read the output and you say that output seems reasonable, but if you know the input, you would say, oh, it made a mistake. And of course, if you think about letting AI write our HPIs, you're not gonna have access to the medical interview that generated that API, right? All HPI, all you're gonna have is the HPI at the end. And so the concern about accuracy is obviously huge here. But, this is gonna be overcome in the near future. I wanna point out, first of all, that ChatGPT is not designed to write HPIs, and there are AIs designed, there are comp whole entire companies built on listening to medical interviews and generating an HPI from it, you know, that are much better tuned than just throwing stuff into ChatGPT and playing with your prompts until you get good output. Um, this is like, this is not an existential problem for AI. This is actually quite a fixable problem, and it will be fixed if it, it, it kind of already is fixed even in the present, but certainly in the near future. Um, what I think is gonna happen here is something where, you know, you can imagine that our notes are, our notes can become, as, as doctors, can become highly information driven, right? That platonic pure medical note which doesn't have all the nonsense that there that's there for billing and medical legal reasons it just has the key important information that you want you could write that note and then let the ai add all the other nonsense that needs to go in the note right like that could happen so you've got you know the, the bullet points here and then the ai goes here and of course if you think about that for a minute you can think oh well we could probably have an ai read the medical notes too and summarize only the salient points for the doctor so in fact that long prose-ish medical note is almost used by no one right you get a doctor writing just the important stuff some ai things going on for billing and medical legal reasons and then it comes out on the other end essentially just the important stuff again and 
although, you know, that sounds a little tongue in cheek. I think this is actually how AI changes how we write writ large. What these AI large language models show me is how much um, extraneous stuff there is in our writing, how much flourishes and unnecessary transitions and things that don't necessarily even convey emotion like a great writer will, right? You know, like like Hemingway doesn't use these flourishes. <laughs> um, Hemingway's writing is not boring. Um, it is very human. And I think these these large language models actually force us to write better, like write more succinct, write more powerfully. Um, don't just stretch out, you know, one paragraph of information into two pages like you're writing an, a, a book report in um, in seventh grade, right? Which is which is how a lot of these large language models feel. Um, so maybe the real far future of medical notes is that we actually make them useful again. That large language models translating to and from medical notes becomes quickly ridiculous and we start to realize that we should use these things for what they were originally intended, which is actually taking care of patients. So we'll see. There's a lot left. I don't think we're getting replaced by generative AI. Um, in fact, I think it's going to make us better and I think it's gonna trim a lot of the fat from the system as we realize that if something can be done this easily by an AI, then it's probably not that valuable. See you next time.